thanks everyone for joining today's webcast. Um, we're gonna give it one minute uh, for any of the scragglers to join and then we'll get started. Courtesy one minute. I think anybody in the chat, if uh, if you can hear us or if there's any issues with the connection, feel free to uh, you know send us a quick note there, and we can we can try to get that resolved. But hopefully, everyone can see and hear us well. This will. Uh, all right, guys, I think this will be our first uh, first webinar without a PowerPoint. This should be a good, um, good conversation. I'm excited. <laughs> OK, well, let's get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar, The Evolution of Robotics Technology. I'm your host, uh, Jason Likens. I'm the VP of Product Management here at Ripcord. And today, joining me on our panel of experts, uh, for discussion today are Kevin Hall, uh, CTO and founder of Ripcord, as well as Saman Farid, who is uh, a partner at Baidu Ventures. Um, Kevin, you want to give a little bit more background and introduction to yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, everyone, for joining. Um, as Jason mentioned, my name is Kevin. Um, so most of my background is in the uh, robotics space and manufacturing, uh, specifically using computer vision systems uh, to do all sorts of different applications uh, that, that we've worked on and, and here at Ripcord, um, really gearing that technology towards um, the digitization process. Um, so really excited to um, be a part of this and uh, with Simon here as well, looking forward to talking about a variety of topics and interesting areas for, uh, for this technology, both at Ripcord and also uh, in other spaces too. So uh, Simon, you wanna give a quick uh, intro? Yeah, absolutely. Great to uh, great to be here. It's really, really wonderful to to spend time with uh, both of you guys and I hear some of the questions from the rest. Uh, happy to give a little bit of background. Um, my my name is Saman. I uh, have been investing in kind of AI, machine learning, and robotics for the last uh, ten years or so uh, through a variety of different uh, venture funds. Uh, most recently, I started. Uh, I headed up um, the, the venture fund for Baidu, which is. Um, the kind of similar to Google as a large uh, search engine company and also has a large AI and research initiative. And um, basically, you know, I've been really passionate about uh, this kind of wave of, of technology change that's happening. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons is that, you know, we just see so many different opportunities for robotics and uh, artificial intelligence to change the way that everybody works and lives uh, across every industry. Um, and it's really, uh, we're, we're just at the very beginning of this of this big transformation, but it's going to be uh, like another industrial revolution, uh, if not bigger. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's amazing to be here with Ripcord. It's an incredible example of, of this kind of change. Great. Thank you. And welcome, Kevin and Saman. Um, so today's topic that the you know, it's a very fast pace. It's a leading edge market. Um, using all the latest technologies with robotics, machine learning, AI, natural language processing, all these technologies are catch catching up to uh, market initiatives, uh, digital transformation and otherwise to, to get some business benefit and, and leverage that across the organization. Um, Kevin, maybe you can start off and, and why is Ripcord and this new technology of particular interest to Ripcord? Yeah. Um... Sure. So, you know, at Ripcord, we when we were first getting started, um, we started looking at all of um, all the paper based processes um, that businesses, every, almost every business still deals with, as well as the kind of historical um, backlog of all of this um, paper data, essentially, as we view it, um, stored in, in warehouses. Um, the you know state of the art at that time was or was still just using hand tools and, um, and high-speed scanners to try to create images um, of, of this content and then use software to um, do things like OCR to you know, extract some, some text for search. Um, and where we really became interested in, in specifically robotics and AI from the beginning were, was when we asked ourselves, is that as good as it gets? Um, or you know, 
is there a better way to do this and um, using today's technology you know that we're really able to um, you know take a crack at solving this problem so um, from from the start that's what we knew we wanted to do um, leveraging robots and different AI technologies um, both on the machines but also within the rest of our, our software pipeline to pull pull the most valuable data uh, rapidly out of out of that content so you know, Ripcord, that's been part of our, you know, DNA from the very beginning um, because we, you know, took this new approach to solving um, solving for that problem. The proverbial building a better mousetrap, more more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, and, and Sam, on, on, on your end, you have a particular um, benefit being in a venture capital in this type of a, uh, technology um, so you get to see all the leading edge stuff, you know, kind of first to market. Uh, what are some of those things that you're seeing out there today? Um, kind of active in the market today and starting to get a little bit leading edge and next generation. Yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of the uh, recent uh, changes that have happened were a result of two kind of major shifts uh, uh, that happened over the last 10 years. On, on the one side, I think the smartphone kind of revolution and the mobile penetration created this supply chain uh, where people have been able to make components uh, for much, much cheaper than they previously could. So whether that's sensors or cameras, uh, screens or batteries, um, all of those are things that um, are extremely useful when you want to build a robot. Uh, it brings down the cost, it increases the capability. Um, and so that's been you know one, one of these kind of tr trending forces that we've seen. Uh, on the other side, uh, uh, around kind of deep learning as a technology specifically, but broader into AI, the ability for computers to kind of interpret complex sets of data has also drastically increased in the last few years. Uh, and that's resulted in things like natural language processing, computer vision, um, OCR, you know, all of these uh, drastically improving. And we see kind of self-driving cars and many other things uh, happening as a result of those two uh, major forces. And so, um, you know, to answer your question about what we're seeing specifically, uh, a very large range where these technologies can become useful. Um, whether it's kind of document management and, 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 and processing of paper uh, records um, uh, or, you know, uh, automating your, your, your self-driving car, uh, automating, uh, automating uh, an entire manufacturing line or facility, um, you know, creating much more efficiency in a construction site, um, surveying, you know, using drones to solve all kinds of problems. I, I think kind of the list is is endless. And, and to be honest, I think we were only seeing just the beginning of it so far. Um, I think uh, as these first few applications uh, take off, um, we'll see a, a new generation of components and a new generation of technology and a lot more interest being poured into this space. Um, and so really it is kind of this exponential shift in, in, in the way that uh, basically, you know, tasks are accomplished and decisions are made uh, in in every kind of business. Yeah, uh, the pace is amazing. It seems like we're on this cusp of uh, the technology going to push us through to the next levels of things that we never even thought possible before. Um, this fourth generation of the industrial revolution. It's a it's a very exciting time. Um, so, so in, interesting things too, just to consider in terms of like human robot interaction and what that looks like, you know, we're, I think today going to talk, you know, try to keep it focused on like the enterprise, right. And, and how ro this technology is great for the enterprise. And, um, you know, when you think about businesses, it's going to be like a lot of those concepts of how does, you know, what, what does that interaction look like, especially as we see more and more of these use cases come along. Um, uh, it's going to be, yeah, pretty, pretty exciting to, to watch. Yeah. So, so Kevin, to expand on that a bit, um, there's this concept of, you know, even the, even the title of this uh, webinar, robotics. But I think people use that term very broadly. Um, there's robotic process automation as an example that that uh, is more a software bot. Yep. Uh, and then there's the physical hardware of of an actual robot. Um, how do you see these two technologies coming together in the enterprise and with kind of this digital transformation and unstructured content? What are some of the use cases and the combinations of those two technologies? Yeah, um, I think, 
both our um, both forms of kind of you know core hardware robotics and, and machines and automation as well as uh, you know software bots through through RPA um, are really going to be critical for for the enterprise. I think RPA in particular um, is, is super interesting because it can globally support most most companies out there will have a use case or, or do right now have a use case for that sort of technology to take the you know where, where robotics typically really shine is in more the more um, environments where there's really repetitive tasks or very um, uh, tasks that have like a, a bunch of data where you need some just uh, a robotic system or an automated system behind the scenes uh, crunching the numbers and um, building those models so I think um, you know that's the case for so many different enterprises out there today so I think what we're really excited about is we we here at Ripcord think that um, our our approach is really enabling for RPA because um, there's a huge amount of data out there that companies have stored on paper um, and for machine learning to really become um, take, take off and for these models to really uh, improve to help classify your records and extract valuable data specific to your organization uh, it's going to be really important to connect that information through a pipeline that's uh, leveraging machine learning to improve um, and that's what we've you know designed our system to do from the beginning which is only going to better enable um, software automation to then uh, do more you know uh, more advanced processes as well with with the content um, uh, I don't know if that the yeah, question uh, yeah so the uh, the automation piece so um, using data-driven automation extracting some some uh, values out of the content and and driving some automation processes. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with that. RPA has exposed that very well. Uh, people are taking advantage of it. Do you see any areas where maybe the technology could be used in other ways? Um, maybe some underrated or underutilized uh, capabilities of uh, this enrichment to unstructured content? Uh, Kevin, Salman, you guys you know, what's the next wave of taking advantage of this or what, what have people not quite realized yet around analytics maybe or line of business integrations, things like that? Yeah, I mean, I think at the, at the, the easiest way for me to think about it is when I, when I try to consider, you know, in an enterprise, what are the types of decisions people need to make? Um, of course, every, every team, every department within an organization has different kinds of decisions that they're trying to uh, make and and uh, you know so for example with the with the accounting team you know you know they need to they need to know about all the accounts receivable payables all of the uh, inventory on hand things like that with, if you're managing a warehouse and the logistics in your in your facility uh, you need to know about kind of every piece of uh, equipment that's in there and and periodically need to be able to do surveys and maybe be able to predict demand uh, whether it's on the marketing side or whether it's on a manufacturing floor and and across you know every department in in you know a large organization decisions are being made daily um the challenge is that you know a lot of the times i think people don't have enough information to make uh the most optimal decision uh they follow a certain set of rules for example uh they'll order inventory when it falls below you know a certain threshold um those types of decisions right now uh uh, served us well uh, when we were doing things uh, in a very, very repeated, re repeatable way. So if I was trying to build, you know, 10 million chairs, you know, then, you know, whenever I get below a certain order quantity, I'll, I'll order a few more, you know, more steel or whatever supplies that I need. Uh, but uh, as we move to a world where complexity is increasing and, and for example, a manufacturing facility or uh, a comp any company really needs to uh, adapt their plans on a daily basis rather than making annual plans and then just sticking to the annual plan or making quarterly plans and sticking to the quarterly plan. Really, organizations need to basically be updating their plans on a daily basis based on lots and lots of information. In order to be able to do that, uh, the amount of information that people will need is, is just so much more. Um, and uh, the, the reality is the majority of that information that they need is not currently in a digital form. Uh, so whether it's on paper or whether it's just in the form of the number of boxes that are sitting on shelves in your warehouse, um, there needs to be some way of taking uh, all of that physical world and turning it into a digital representation so that we can understand it, uh, understand much, much more of it, and then be able to make decisions using it. That, that's great. Thanks, Salman. Um, Kevin, maybe you can apply a similar use case um, 
to, to leveraging that paper, the information locked away in paper in the oil and gas industry. I know some of our attendees are from that space and, and uh, maybe you can share some of your experiences with that. Yeah, uh, sure. So we, um, I mean, right now, probably behind this wall, there's a bunch of robots uh, scanning some some paper for the oil and gas industry. Um, you know, it's been pretty pretty fascinating to see uh, uh, see the sorts of applications and insights um, that uh, these companies are looking to get out of their historical data. Um, and what's just fascinating, I think, is um, you know, if you, if you can get over that that real or get to the realization that you know the data you have um, on these records when you get if you get them digitized through a pipeline that's going to be able to learn and improve um, as it sees more and more of that content um, whether you're trying to extract information about um, location like where where was this what well does this record uh, tie to um, or you know deeper insights into actually on the exploration side trying to look at the a combination of inputs from active data today, as well as historical data that's been in paper to then go and do uh, uh, varying levels of uh, exploration, looking for new new uh, places to, to drill for, for oil. Um, it's we, We've seen a really strong commitment from uh, our customers in this space to uh, leverage both, you know, new new information that's coming in through um, from out on the edge and from their, their different IoT devices and other data tracking systems and pair it with their historical data um, which there's just a huge amount of useful information there. Um, and if you put all of those things through the same um, training pipeline, uh, the, what comes out the other side is um, really powerful and only gets better with time. So, you know, the early adopters, I think in this case, are going to be the most um, in the best position moving forward. I think that's yeah. something that I just want to pick up on something that, that Kevin mentioned, because I think that, that it, it's a really, really uh, meaningful point that, you know, people are, implementing, you know, let's say IOT devices or sensors, or all these different things on all of their equipment. Uh, but a lot of the historical structure of like, you know, what, what uh, it takes a lot of time to manually create a structure for all that data to, to go somewhere. Um, it becomes very inefficient and people often don't have a good, uh, like it's very, very difficult to justify the ROI of those, uh, of those investments in, in new assets. Um, but uh, once they have a certain baseline of, for example, taking like a lot of historical information and having a digital representation of that and then using that to build these models, then things like IoT data and sensor data can make a lot more sense because it can tie in to this uh, structure um, of, you know, basically all, all the history of, of, uh, of a facility. And I think that applies just as much in the oil and gas. And maybe one more addition on that, um, on the more, a little more on the hardware robotic side, it's been really exciting uh, from, from our point of view um, you know, one of the things you you often get with um, a robotic machine as opposed to, you know, a more traditional like automated machine is is flexibility. Um, you know, robots are inherently more flexible than a, you know, a more rigid uh, machine or mechanism. And this really um, uh, speaks to, I think, some of the, uh, the things that are only recently becoming uh, possible in, in the space of, you know, using robotics and, and AI to handle um, more flexibly, um, more types of inputs. Um, and what we've found when we started processing records for the oil and gas space is that there's all sorts of different formats that, um, uh, that data is stored on, um, you know, everything from regular sheets of paper to really long, well logged um, and, and big maps and that sort of thing um, with, with different fasteners and all, all of the above, like a huge amount of um, variable input. And using a robot um, with a perception system on the front end that's able to, you know, robustly figure out what we're looking at, which is a, you know, for us, a ML based system. Um, we were able to like rapidly uh, address those sorts of new types of content, um, which is something I think a few, a few years or five years ago, five plus years ago, when it wouldn't necessarily have been possible because it has to leverage technology that new, new technology that we have today, uh, both on the perception side, but also then on the hardware side of the machine that's flexible enough to, to handle that type of content. Um, and we see that it, it's really exciting because this type of application, I hope other companies will, will see a similar trend where they're able to you know, use ro robots to unlock um, uh, and disrupt a certain space, which then opens up a lot of other opportunities to build more machines and more robots to, to keep, keep improving. Um, and we see a lot of opportunity for that in, in the oil and gas space. 
Yeah, it, it seems like the deeper your data set is, the more, um, you know, information you have to create your machine learning or AI. And, um, you know, if, if 80% of the world is unstructured and a large percent of that is in paper, um, getting access to that information to feed your data sets and, and just make those things smarter each time is, is really valuable and important. Uh, you mentioned something kind of uh, interesting, Kevin, about the ability of the robots to handle the paper. And um, can you explain a little bit some, you know, what the benefits of that is related to privacy and security and, you know, some of these GDPR um, type regulations that are top of mind? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, part of one of the biggest benefits of using a machine to automate the digitization process is uh, the, the fact that, you know, it's it's much less touch time uh, from people, which has mul mul a multitude of benefits, um, inc including speed um, and efficiency that we can we can process and the scale at which we can do it. Um, and from a security point of view, um, you know, there's less uh, less opportunity for uh, or, or less people looking at the records. Uh, there's not a ne necessarily a KPI or a metric uh, in the industry that tracks that met uh, that number, but um, for sure, using machines uh, to to automate the process from a security point of view is is really important, um, and I, and I think that's a trend probably for a lot of different um, uses for robots in the enterprise. Like something that comes to mind is like in a in a hospital, if you have ground vehicles delivering um, you know important like medicines or the, you know patient information from room to room, uh, which is a common a growing use case in healthcare. Um, you know that's pretty sensitive information and. Uh, there's a benefit to using a machine to do that sort of um, that sort of workload um, from an efficiency point of view, but also from a privacy point of view, because um, you know it's it's a machine, it's a robot, it it uh, is just going to go and, and do what do what it's told, and not um, not have the opportunity for that security issue. And I think just to add to that, the other the other benefit of it is that there's you know very very clear records for everything that happens. Um, so if, if, if something is processed in a certain way or came through a certain box or whatever it might be, um, exactly what touch points happened and when they happened and where they happened is all recorded uh, in a lot of detail, uh, which from a privacy perspective and a security perspective is extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, thank you. So I want to go back to one of the comments you made about, um, you know, how some of this mining the unstructured content uh, can add value to other use cases in the case of iot it makes it that much stronger so if you look at kind of data out there today you have, you have structured data and databases um, coming from applications you have unstructured content from users emails uh, documents these types of things and you have device data uh, that is very quickly escalating it's kind of you know as far as the next generation this is where a lot of the data is going to be coming from iot um, could you could you maybe come up with a use case on how some of the structured unstructured content could could enrich and add value for that IoT um, data that's coming in? Um, how how would an IoT you know something's coming up for maintenance um, on my brakes on my car and how would I leverage some other unstructured or structured content to combine with that? to make that IoT data that much more valuable. That was an interesting point you made. Yeah, I think, um, you know, like the easiest way to think about it is the historical data tells you what the kind of normal conditions should be or what the like optimal condition should be. So if you just hook up a sensor to whether it's your car or, or, or uh, you know, some, some pump in a refinery, um, it's very, very hard to know whether the data that you're collecting means that it's it's in a, it's in good shape or it's in uh, or or it's having issues or it's trending towards uh, some issue, um, and the only way to be able to uh, kind of contextualize that data is to have historical records. So that historical records, I of course, uh, some of it may be records of that same data. Some of it may be records of other operating conditions that give you correlations. For example, when yeah, uh, if the AI can be trained to understand that. Um, a certain sound in the car is correlated with certain types of um, engine failure. Well, that by itself is a very, very useful uh, piece of information. So even if it doesn't necessarily detect 
uh, the engine failure through some sensor that you install. If you have a microphone in there and you detect uh, a sound that is similar to the sound that happened when there was previously an engine failure, that pattern is a useful piece of information for the operator. Um, so I think that uh, you know that that contextual side of things really comes from structured data or some human annotation, right? There has to be a person who comes in and says, you know, this is what we're trying to optimize. We want it to make this type of sound or something like that. Um, uh, and and the only way to get there is is to have uh, uh, sufficient historical records. And um, you know, I think like uh, machine maintenance is is one example, but the, um, uh, extend of uh, data that we need. For example, uh, when trying to make decisions about you know where to where to uh, where to drill uh, for for a new uh, a new oil well or or what type of land to buy, what kind of land use rights to to buy or not buy, uh, you know, a lot of that type of historical information. Right now, there's people who look through it. There's geologists. There's things like that who, who have uh, a certain amount of you know subject matter knowledge and a certain amount of experience. But um, that often could be supplemented by uh, lots and lots and lots of training examples. And you know, even the best uh, engineer in the world, you know, has maybe you know sixty or seventy years of experience that they can bring to the table. Um, you know, but but uh, AI system trained on uh, disparate data from a large number of sources can easily, you know, in a matter of days, train on you know hundreds of years of experience uh, across hundreds of locations. Um, and so that uh, by itself gives the gives a company that kind of structural advantage of, of, of experience driven decision making. Yeah, that's a huge, uh, huge driver for why it's so important to get your content digital, right? Um, because you, you need it to be digital to give your teams and software tools the opportunity to even, you know, train or learn from that, that, you know, important history. And I think some, something else, like maybe a slightly different angle to, to think at this from, um, or something that we really think about a lot at Ripcord, um, is this concept of you know a fleet a fleet of machines or robots um, and being able to you know work together and learn from one another based on their um, you know the history of what they've processed and what they've seen um, this is especially important I think for any um, robotic system that's having to deal with um, an unstructured world or input um, you know at Ripcord this is you know mainly in the form of unstructured content where we have sheets of all different sizes and fasteners and folders and all sorts of things that have that we've used to store our information and needing to be able to flexibly handle that but if you know in all, all sorts of different use cases whether it's you know robots that are trying to um, pick up something or, or know where to put something off of a, a table or out of a bin or into a truck um, you know there's there's some really interesting, or almost re it's required for those systems to work together and and learn from one another, um, you know, based on what what they're seeing in the world, and and that all is coming out of this broader data set um, that you know these systems are are you know connecting um, to. So that's really important at Ripcord. We we see you know uh, we have this fleet of systems, and we're we're building more and more uh, as we grow, um, and it's uh, really interesting to connect these. Um, these systems together and share that data to uh, to then make better decisions um, uh, and uh, get even more automated and more flexible. Yeah, I, I, I think that's an interesting point and, you know, may, maybe where part of the next generation goes, you have this catalog of information that you can cross reference and find um, other relevances and relationships and um, you know, scores and ranks of, of the content uh, that can be leveraged in, in ways that aren't really thought about today, but you have all the, the data and you can use it in the future. Uh, kind of like uh, Salman was mentioning earlier, it's, it's a little bit, it's much more relevant to get an IoT piece of data if you can compare it against 10 years worth of previous data. So that's very interesting. So yeah. um, uh, next question, maybe final question, you know, with all these new technologies and leading edge stuff and you know, moving faster than ever before. What's what are some of your predictions for the future? Where do you see this all going, and how it's being leveraged? Uh, you know, other than robots taking over the world and and, and that. Where, what do you what do you see, Salman, as uh, in the future? What do you see in your crystal ball? I think uh, there's really just so many different uh, so many different areas where where these kinds of changes are happening. Um, I think. Right now, it's been very, very exciting because we've seen, uh, you know, internally we think about it as node efficiency versus system efficiency. So right now, a lot of nodes 
in any business are becoming more and more efficient because of technology. So whether that's uh, optimizing, you know, ads on, on your online platform or whether it's uh, increasing the efficiency of uh, a, a certain process in your manufacturing line, um, uh, you know, these each of these nodes, there's, there's equipment, there's technology, and there's ideas that are coming together to make that more efficient. Um, what we think is really, really going to be exciting is in the next few years, as enough nodes become digitized and uh, have some technology built into it, uh, it's going to become possible to have system level efficiency. Um, so system level efficiency, and you know what I mean by that is uh, when you want to link different parts of a very complex chain to each other. Uh, so you know you manage your your supply chain and your procurement in combination with your um, uh, expected kind of production and you run your marketing efforts and all of these things uh, work together uh, so that uh, you can kind of optimize. So when you know, for example, you're going to have some spare capacity a month before that, your marketing efforts can ramp up. Uh, or if you know that uh, you have, uh, you're have you producing something and there's some, uh, or some material that you're on short supply on, then in advance, your procurement system will automatically go out and start bidding across a variety of replacement materials. Um, so I think that, you know, like the entire enterprise is getting to a point where uh, a lot of these managerial functions are going to be able to be drastically enhanced uh, with technology uh, and humans are going to be able to really unleash the, the creative side of that. Uh, so instead of spending time just uh, kind of doing very repetitive work or rule based work, um, we'll be able to, uh, to spend our time kind of creatively making decisions and thinking about new ways that we can build and grow our businesses. That, that's great. That's exciting. Yeah, that, it kind of gets on the edge of the predict and prescribe and, and automate. Um, thank you for that. Thank you. What's the future hold? Yeah, good. Uh, and so I think that's an amazing, um, amazing future. And uh, that's, I think, really aligns with, uh, you know, a lot of uh, my thoughts and what I see. So maybe I'll, um, uh, a little more on maybe the robotics or the manufacturing side. Um, uh, I think we're going to be in, in manufacturing uh, a pretty major um, leap forward through connecting um, our many systems together and having that more, you know, global perspective of the system as a whole um, and leveraging, uh, you know, artificial intelligence to become more flexible, uh, which I think will be really really important. Um, I also think, you know, I, I think we see a lot and Samadhi probably, I think you're invested in many of these types of technologies too, you know, enabling technologies for this space. I think we'll see a lot of growth in, you know, this is things like sensors and uh, communications platforms and things like this that are able to um, really enable uh, the future of, of uh, these robots to then get into the enterprise, for instance, and um, start to provide this more universal value. Um, uh, you know, for, for all sorts of different use cases. So I think, you know, we'll see a lot of um, interesting technology coming out of that area as well. That's Great. things like LiDAR, new cameras, and, um, you know, things that are, um, you know, edge compute and, and all sorts of different areas that can really be enabling technologies for this space. And then, you know, companies are going to bundle those pieces together to, you know, build really impactful systems to, uh, you know, support uh, certain industries and, and also more globally the uh, the enterprise as a whole. Yeah, just just because you mentioned uh, cameras, you know, I think one example just to kind of take that point home is really uh, uh, the way that kind of all these devices are going to be rebuilt for for kind of computers to interpret the physical world. So right now, cameras are pretty much all designed in a way that are optimized to make you know the pixels look pretty and have colors and look really nice so that when a human eye looks at that, that image, they can interpret and understand what that means. Uh, but, you know, as, as more and more of this data is being fed to computers, uh, cameras are going to be able to be completely redesigned uh, so that uh, cameras are built, you know, for example, with multispectral uh, lenses that look at a wide array of different things. They look at depth. They look at, like you mentioned, LiDAR. Uh, and that by itself is going to create uh, just a whole new revolution of uh, what robotics is able to do. It's an exciting time, and uh, I think we're all looking forward to be a part of that in the future. Um, so I want to thank our guests, uh, Saman and Kevin, for joining and sharing their thoughts on the evolution of robotics technology. Uh, this webcast will be recorded and rebroadcast. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining, and have a great day.
All right. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Saman. I appreciate the conversation. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Great to, yeah, really enjoyed it. All right. Thanks. Cheers.